Welcome, I'm Sebastian Mahfoud, and you are listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom, as we welcome today The Lost Voice, with John Studi and Jacob Nelson. Welcome to The Lost Voice Radio, I'm John Studi, and along with Jacob Nelson, we are here to bring you the sweet, soothing sounds of Socratic wisdom. Jacob, I see you're chuckling at my... Terrible attempt at having one of those smooth and relaxing disc jockey voices. Jazz radio. Jazz radio. I don't know how to do that. I never really listened to jazz radio. I am yeah. terribly boring. My wife, uh, she loses it because every time she comes into my car, I am blasting loud talk radio <laughs> <laughs> music. Rocking out to talk radio. Oh my gosh, it's so great. Well, I can't stand anything on the radio in terms of music. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. With the exception of like classical rock stations. Those are kind of fun. Classic um, rock. Is 70s, fast. 80s. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the good stuff right there. Well, or even older. The oldies station here in the Twin Cities... Changed from true oldies to like classic rock, so we don't have a station anymore that plays like sixties and seventies mm-hmm. music. It's all seventies or later, which is unfortunate. It is unfortunate, yeah. but you know what? You know what bothers me about this though. What? So if oldies used to be from like the forties and fifties, and yeah. then and maybe in the sixties, and you get into classic seventies and eighties rock. Yep. Um, and now they've bumped the uh, the seventies and eighties music over to the classical or to, over to the oldest station. Uh-huh. That means in maybe a decade or two, our music that we grew up with, yeah, you know, Britney Spears. No, but you see, that's the thing is that that music is trash, and it's <laughs> never going to make the leap to what say Sticks could be or what Sticks is. Well, that's where most of the music from, from the 90s and the early 2000s actually came from was right. Sticks. Mm-hmm. Sticks, for right. those of you who, yeah. yeah, it's a river in hell. But I know what you're saying. It's almost like, you know, some of our culture is being lost. It is. Yeah. It, it, no, it's absolutely true. It's true. Um, and that's, that's one of the funny things is that people, <sighs> when I tell this to my youth ministry kids. Wait, was that pause so you could get your soapbox out? Yes. Great. And so I can th- throw my brand new fancy wallet. You see, last week, no, two weeks ago, <laughs> I threw my wallet during some sort of tirade, and my wallet at the time was just a rubber band around on my cards. <laughs> but now I've got a real fancy wallet. Leather. It's leather, even. Yeah. It cost me a whole $12. Isn't it ironic they have to spend money to put your money into something? I think, I think they do that on purpose. Yeah. Wait, there was a soapbox moment. Oh, yes, my soapbox <laughs> moment. My soapbox moment is whenever I tell my kids that there is an objective value and an objective standard for the beauty of the music. Just because you might like one thing or another, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily more beautiful or less beautiful. There, that within the different kinds of music themselves, there is an objective standard of beauty. That's true. And I think that at least part of the evidence for this is the longevity of a particular brand or style or um, or a uh, or, or particular composer's music. And um, how it's uh, incorporated within the wider culture. For instance, you will necessarily have to understand and listen to Mozart and Beethoven um, in schools, and this is what you're going right. to study in terms of music right. as as the foundation, as uh, that which uh, gives rise to all other Western uh, modes of uh, uh, musical expression. But give it a hundred, and, and you know, right now we might also study, and I remember doing this when I was in high school, we'd study the contemporary pop and rock and hip-hop and everything, but Give it another 150 years, not a single person's going to know who Justin Timberlake is. Who? I don't know either. My, <laughs> my wife occasionally makes mention of this Justin oh, Timberlake okay. guy. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what he, who he is. I think he acted on SNL or something like that at one point. Mm. But um, in 100 years, guess who's still going to be the one who has studied for his contribution to the musical landscape? It's going to be Mozart or Beethoven or Bach. Hopefully. Hopefully. Have you ever seen the movie Idiocracy? You know, (laughs) the more this political... Okay, kid, speaking of music and idiocracy, did you see Kid Rock's uh, campaign speech? No. He announced his his campaign um, intention, his campaigning intentions to run for... Yep, run for Senate. And he uh, put forth his uh, platform. And man, it was just exactly like Idiocracy where that... 
comes out of the White House and he gives his big speech yeah. and there's like the every time he makes a point there's uh, explosions explosions and stuff and that's exactly what Kid Rock does literally no different oh that's awesome he'll make, he'll make a point and then somebody will like you know do a really loud strum on the electric guitar or, or hit the drums or, or something like that it was insane so what you're telling me is that you have seen Idiocracy no, I've only seen that clip you sent me oh. <laughs> after Donald Trump got elected. <laughs> now we'll know we here on Lost uh, Lost Voice Radio. We love our president. Um, he's tremendous. He is tremendous. He's like what six two? That's a pretty I big don't guy. Know. He's a pretty big guy. He's huge. He's huge. Um, and we'll tease him, but we tease everybody. So right. don't take any of our comments as being pro Trump or anti Trump. It's just we're being goofy. Right. I'm anti other candidates. Yes. Of which I will not say anything right now. We will not name anybody. Right. None. Though I am interested in this whole Kid Rock. Are you? Are you pulling it up right now? I am. Are we going to listen to it or are you just going to watch it on on, on silent? Well, no, I'm just looking at his his website right now. Oh, he has a website? Um, You know, it doesn't surprise uh, me. Most people would. Well, yeah. In his situation. Um, It's interesting. (laughs) Interesting is a word. Yeah, he says one thing is for sure, though. The Democrats are... Well, there's words in here that I probably can't say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we're internet-based, but... Oh, no, where, where are we at? Let me see this. Um, yeah, so, and then he says oh, we'll wow. be scheduling a press conference the next six weeks or so to address this issue amongst others. And if I decide to throw my hat in the ring for U.S. Senate, believe me, it's game on. Blankety-blankers. Oh, it's lovely. Part of me says bring it on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to see this kind of stuff happen. Who knows? Maybe having oh, other wild personality like Kid Rock in the Senate might get some stuff done. Who knows? But yeah. oh. You know what, though? I mean, if the Democrats have the likes of Al Franken. Oh, my gosh. And um, Keith Ellison, who is like a self-proclaimed uh, crazy, nutty deranged individual that represents Minnesota. Thank mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. You know, why don't the Republicans have a Donald Trump and a Kid Rock? We should. It's potato, potato. Yeah. You know? And two sides of the same coin or something. I mean, I'm not advocating for Kid Rock to win. Oh. But, oh. you know, it's it's interesting. He's got slogans like, you know, like, <laughs> um, party of the people. That used to be a, a Democrat slogan sure. back when they actually represented, you know, people, not just special interests, and, right? You know, corporations. Um, Kid Rock slogan is "Party to the People." <laughs> Welcome to the party. Oh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Is he running out of Michigan? I thought it was like Nevada or something. No, I don't know. He couldn't. He couldn't win there. Where is he running? I don't know. Well, that's what we're going to hit the, hit the Google thing. <laughs> At the bottom of his website, it says, paid for by me. Well, that, uh, yeah, that's one of the benefits, I guess, of being a, what do you call it, a celebrity. You can pay for your own, pay for your own campaign. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. This is right. a, well, this was you a, know what, this is a, probably a blemish on the face of our culture, but, you know, we study, we assess, we explain we move on you know Jake I don't know about you well that's true you don't know about me very well I don't I try to avoid most most associations with you as I possibly can that's fair I do yeah. too good with yourself or yeah. with me no okay. well with both uh, alright yeah and I, you do what you need to do but I think that you and I can at least agree on one thing yeah sometimes we feel old <laughs> I know we're both still, you know, 29, have even... I just want to be clear that you are older than me. I am. I am older than you. I am more world-weary. Bitter. Men. <laughs> more bearded. You're way less bearded I than I am. I am way less bearded than you are. Um, I wonder who has more gray hairs. We should p- compare sometime. I don't know. Probably you, because redheads don't really gray. That's fair. I don't know. It's kind of nice, actually. Yeah. Are you saying my hair is fair, or is fair that... Hey. What's one kind of music that oh, a gosh. redhead can't play? Soul. Soul. Ah! <laughs> What's the one 
city on the planet a redhead can't visit. Where? Also Seoul. Ah, South Korea, yeah. which is unfortunate because the Olympics are the next year. You also can't year. drive a Kia Seoul, which is from South Korea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's sad. I could steal Seoul's, though. That's fair. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway. We are really pushing our luck with our 10 minutes of obligatory nonsense there, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Anyway, the point of the story is sometimes I feel a little old. <clears throat> and I remember uh, la- the last year and the year before, there was a girl in my youth group who is the embodiment of the internet and the embodiment of all millennial culture. And uh, the nice thing was is that she was actually able to bridge the gap between my old uh, Fogarty. Is that a word, right? Fogartiness? I'm an old Fogarty? Fogey. Fogey? Fogarty Fogey? is a great musician is from Creedence Clearwater Revival, John Fogarty. Sure. All right. She can speak to an old Fogey like me. And you say you like classic rock. You don't know who John Fogarty is? I was sheltered when I was a kid. Uh, they didn't let me listen to anything other than, like, Carmen and Petra, which Petra was good. If but, you say so. Well, fine, Jake. Anyway. Anyway, so I loved having her around because kids would say things, and I would have absolutely no idea <laughs> <laughs> what they were talking about. I think one of my favorite examples was the word bay. People were just kind of throwing this bay, oh, it's bay, so annoying. Bay, bay out there. And I got finally tired of it, and I asked this girl, and she told me exactly what it meant. I'm like, geez, that's stupid. It used to be BFF, basically, but, you know, my best friend, best friend forever. But now it's bay, meaning before all, of it, or before all, before all else. Mm. Which sounds more idolatrous. That does sound really idolatrous. I didn't know that it actually had, it was an acronym. Yeah, it's an acronym. Well, you know, our generation invented Internet Speak. And the acronyms, and the other generation has yes. just copied it. And but our generation sort of makes me sad. Yeah, but also sometimes happy. There's good things about our generation. I do love my own generation, which would be Matthias. He's adorable. I see how you equivocated on the term generation. <laughs> uh, yep, that's good. So you intercultural know, competencies. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going. We, yeah. I was basically incompetent to move on into <laughs> this strange, strange world of teen lingo. Yeah. Um, and the uh, USCCB, as you guys are probably well aware, we has put out a an intercultural competencies workshop with several modules. And today's module is primarily about uh, understanding culture and how it works and how uh, studying culture can help you bridge that gap. And our main focus today is going to be on two things. One, um, it's going to be focusing on uh, these five parameters of uh, understanding cultures, um, which are collectivism versus individualism, hierarchy versus equality, the low tolerance of ambiguity versus high tolerance of ambiguity, and then um, masculine versus feminine understanding of gender roles, and lived experiences versus abstract orientation, or time orientation. But before we get there, Jacob had the great idea to talk about this quote from Gaudium et Spes, number 53. Um, yeah, the church itself gives a definition of culture, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's important in all philosophy and really every walk of life to define your terms when you are speaking about something. And so I thought it'd be good to just talk about how the church sees culture. Yeah. And so it says, the word culture, in its general sense, indicates all those factors by which man refines and unfolds his manifold spiritual and bodily qualities. It means his effort to bring the world itself under his control by his knowledge and his labor. It includes the fact that by improving customs and institutions, he renders social life more human, both within the family and the civic community. Finally, it is a feature of culture that throughout the the course of time, man expresses, communicates, and conserves in his works great spiritual experiences and desires so that these may be of advantage to the progress of many, even of the whole human family. And just the immediate thought I have with that is Aristotle. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that Aristotle had a hunger for the divine and, and to understand through human reason uh, the idea of God, even if he didn't meet the Judeo-Christian God uh, specifically. Uh, he didn't necessarily understand the Trinity because that's only through revealed truth. Sure. Uh, but he had this penchant and this great desire for mm-hmm. uh, truth and for philosophy, higher being, 
all of that, and it was preserved so that we, even thousands thousands of years later, can grow our culture based on what was done prior. That something done 2,400 years ago can still benefit our culture today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what you were saying, John, earlier, is that you know, 150 years from now, nobody's going to know who Justin Timberlake is. If our culture doesn't get it together and start contributing to society in a good and constructive way, we will actually be a detriment to human society. And our generation after us is going to have to fix things. So instead of progressing towards a goal and building step by step by step, we're taking a step backwards by quite frankly, a bunch of inane and stupid arguments that people just have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, and so our, our the next generation is going to have to rebuild first before they can build further. Right. And one thing that I've been, <clears throat> been kind of dwelling on recently is uh, orienting ourselves always towards the proper end. And that includes basically every human activity, whether it be our own um, spiritual and moral lives, whether it be our political activities, or whether it be gardening. Um, if you, for instance, uh, tend to a rose in the same way you would tend to an oak tree, you know, that rose might not do too well. Um, it might right. survive, but it's not really going to live very well as a, as a rose. If you treat a, a human like an oak tree, well, then what's going to happen? Well, that, you know, you don't, you don't, bury a human in the ground and pour water and fertilizer over them. I mean, that's Wait, not going to be... You're not supposed to? Gee, not on the air. Oh, sorry. Shh. <laughs> Go ahead. Never, never mind. Okay, all right. Um, it's, sorry about that short break there, listeners. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if you... Uh, or, and conversely, if you if you treat an oak tree like a human, that oak tree is not going to do very well either. And uh, part of the, the issue there is that even though the, the, hu the end of, the hu of human nature is much higher than that of an oak tree, it's not proper to an oak tree, and then you're going to be doing damage and violence to the nature and the good of what, that, what the oak tree is supposed to be. It's going to prevent it from actually meeting its, meeting its true good. Yeah. And so in the same way, if we as a culture um, start orienting ourselves away from the right goods uh, at a personal level, um, at a political level, at a spiritual level, at a social level, um, then what's going to happen is that we are going to eventually destroy certain aspects of what it means to be man. Right. And I think one of the areas that we have really fallen astray, or uh, gone astray, is looking to things like government to bring about heaven on earth, to make a utopia, to make paradise right here and right now. But there's a big problem with that. That's not within the competency of any government right. if anything is within the competency of a government it certainly is not bringing about heaven and what's going to happen well we're seeing it already we depend on the government to take care of our poor we depend on the government to take care of our charity we depend on the government to teach us what to think it sounds and like we should be on like a conservative talk angry station right now. i am angry <laughs> and i'm generally conservative more conservative than probably most people but it doesn't even matter about Conservative or liberal here, in my opinion. Um, sure, they might have uh, cer certain things that they'd agree with me more on, on, in some ways and some some less. But, but I'm not. I'm just thinking about just the metaphysics of the thing. Right. If we think right. of society as to bring about, if we think of human government as to bring about something greater than itself, that's not going to happen. Right. The point of government is to bring about the common good. Right. Um, and I think we've missed out on a lot of that. And in terms of our, our, our society and the culture we're producing. Um, one of the things that I think we've gone astray on, again, is this idea of that this, uh, we've lost a sense of transcendentals. Um, truth, goodness, beauty. That's yeah, um, true. And if you look at a classical culture in terms of its artistic expression, um, that's what they're striving after. They're striving after expressing some truth about the world, some beauty right. about God. Well, if you look at classical architect, ar <laughs> architecture, let's just say, of the beautiful churches of yeah. Christendom, uh, whether they're Gothic or they're Romanesque or Neo-Romanesque, whatever, the lines are pointed upwards. Um, they're spacious. They're bright. They're they're talking to us by their very nature of the nature of God. Mm -hmm. um, the archways, the lines pointing upwards, draw our attention upwards, um, and just by entering in, we have kind of this natural awestruckness of 
of what it means to worship. Right. And classical culture did a great job with that, whether it was with the architecture or different arts such as um, music, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, um, earlier with Palestrina uh, and some of the other ones. Or you can look at, you know, Michelangelo, Rembrandt, the, the different arts. You look at Aquinas with his writing. I mean, every facet of classical culture spoke of a higher truth and the higher desire of man. Mm-hmm. But when you get into things like the modern culture, what you start to see is an emptying of these things. And, and we can start with, you know, Rene Descartes and move through Kant and some of the other modern philosophers yep. that lay the framework for this general antipathy towards existence. And when that starts to happen, it erodes the soul. And the culture that's brought about with that is one of kind of hopelessness. Mm-hmm. And we see this um, moving then into the postmodern cultures uh, of today of really a huge amount of hopelessness. And you think about how many people are on antidepressants. Yeah. Not that antidepressants are inherently bad. They're good as a, a progression of medicine. But talk about, you know, when you have 40, 50% of a culture on antidepressants, you have to ask not about whether or not antidepressants are good or bad, but whether or not the culture is good or bad. Right. Um, And so, like, yeah, just the development of culture, just because it moves forward doesn't mean it progresses. I agree. I completely agree. Um, C.S. Lewis said that it's only progress if you're moving towards some goal. Mm. But the problem is we've moved away from the goal. We've moved away from the... Uh, pursuit of uh, uh, as, as, as a whole uh, culture also as individuals the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty itself as something to contemplate, to, to encounter as the highest good. But instead what we've done is we've emptied human nature of all of its distinctive meaning, something that brings it away from that of yeah. rude animals or even inanimate, inanimate objects to some extent by saying that our, our, our good is ultimately to be found here in the present moment and in the things that we can tangibly see. We're constantly uh, tempted, um, as I forget who, had said, who said it, but we're constantly tempted. Oh, maybe it was Jacques Maritain. Jacques Maritain said we were constantly tempted by the uh, flesh pots of phenomenological experience. Um, and if you guys remember the uh, story of Exodus, when the Israelites left mm-hmm. Egypt, uh, after not too long, they started complaining. What did they long for? The flesh pots of Egypt, where they were enslaved. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. Yeah. They wanted to eat these flesh pots, and it's the same way with uh, with human nature. And what we've done is we've emptied ourselves out of all distinctive human meaning for the highest goods. And now, what happens in our art is uh, we've said that there's no such thing as this transcendental transcendent truth or beauty that's out there in the world. Yeah. But uh, really, there's only the individual. And so, what is a person who's an artist going to express? Mm-hmm. The individual, but what right. have you done? You've right. emptied yourself, and right. so we get this empty meaninglessness that you're talking about. Well, and art imitates life, and if you look at, um, you know, how a woman is portrayed um, with Michelangelo and his art, his his uh, sculptures, paintings, whatever else, it beautifully imitates life. And if you look in the 1960s, um, I have to find the artist's name. Um, William de Kooning, he, uh, Willem de Kooning, uh, painted a series of women named Woman Number One, Woman Number Two, Woman Number Three, Woman Number Four, and so on. And the art it completely distorts the image of woman. It's quite detestable, and the mere fact that it's named Woman Number Something versus you know Ophelia or something, you know, I don't know, um, devoids the person of meaning. You know, and so we see this that. As culture um, depreciates or falls apart, uh, we see how that culture starts to view the human person anonymously and corrupted. Hmm. Uh, And so that's something that we need to keep in mind, too. One thing I want to throw in, and this is, I think, we should talk about some other cultural things once the competency workshop is done, because we have a lot to get to today in (laughs) an ever-shortening amount of time. Um, but uh, I was giving a talk recently and I was talking about how um, the number one fear of people is what, John? Public speaking. Public speaking. What's the number two fear of people? Death. Which means that people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> and how sad is that, that we would rather be dead than to do something that is a part of our nature, which is to communicate to others. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
Like that's really messed up. And but I think it's in part because our culture has uh, isolated us so much. Um, but anyway, that's a talk for another day. I think it certainly is. Yes. So now, how speaking of culture, you know, you and I probably would place ourselves more in the classical mindset. I think so. For the most part here. Well, nature's act for the most part. They do, and we have a different nature from other humans, which means we have a different end. <laughs> or something. Anyway. Well, you've been trying to bring about my end for years. Someday, Jake. Someday. <laughs> but your proper end, which is being a virtuous soul in a union with God and ah, all his angels and saints. You. Hey, Jake, I'm out watching out for you. Well, I think um, the first question, before I, I just, there's one question on here that, <laughs> don't slouch and be sad. <laughs> There's one question here. It says, what is intercultural competencies? And I think that gets to the heart of the workshop. Mm -hmm. And it says um, that intercultural competence is the capacity to communicate, relate, and work across cultural boundaries. It involves developing capacity in three areas, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, And so I think just keeping that as kind of our um, background framework, uh, you know, the, the skeleton to which we can put all the flesh that we talk about onto, that really the goal of all of this is to understand that there are differences amongst cultures. Right. Uh, not just the fact that some people look different than others, but customs and, and ways of learning and all kinds of things. Um, and, like, you know, just the way, ways of worship, all kinds of stuff. But then to be truly interculturally competent, we need to think about our own presuppositions and, and learn how to work across cultural boundaries as, as this says um, and <clears throat> you know put prejudices aside that kind of thing but also I think it's really important and you and I talked before the show to point mm-hmm. out that cultures are different they are not the same mm-hmm. and sometimes in those differences some aspects of cultures are in fact objectively evil mm-hmm. it's Ubiquitous in our culture today to use contraception, artificial contraception. That is objectively evil. That is not a good part of our culture. And it contributes to the culture of death. And so we shouldn't communicate that as a good part of our culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if somebody came to our culture and said, wow, you guys are really perpetrating the culture of death, <laughs> how many of us would be like, you know what? You're right. We need to change as a culture. <laughs> right. Very few. Um, but I think that highlights the fact that. When we, re- when we see the necessity of working with other cultures, we cannot fall into the trap of just saying, just because they're different means that everything is good. Right. I think it's a trap that's fallen into far too frequently. Well. Now, sorry to cut yeah, you off. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. Gonna say. Well, I, mean, I, was, I was basically going to be transitioning into the five parameters. Um, and the, what the USCCB here has done is uh, shown us or given us five parameters by which we should frame our approach to other cultures in order to, in order to better understand them so that we can begin to interact with uh, cultures that may be different than ours. Um, and I think that, you know, before we get, begin again, that what Jacob is saying is, uh, is very true, that there are differences within these cultures, and sometimes those differences do um, denote uh, a, a concept of uh, better and worse. Um, yeah. And not, not every culture is going to be equally equally the same. It's not like you're playing an RPG where you get to choose like charisma, strength, and that it, means role playing game. There we go. That one's for that one's for ju- that's for uh, that's some for of Justin. our two two of our greatest listeners who are very into gaming. Um, but uh, you don't get to choose like some stats or whatever, and everybody's equally in the right. same in points. But there's going to be some things that are objectively mm-hmm. bad. But taking that and uh, keeping that into account, I think that when we approach different cultures. We should also keep in mind the same uh, dictum that was given by St. Augustine when he spoke about treating sinners and how we should treat sinners. We should always love the sin, er, <laughs> er, <laughs> <laughs> nice catch. but hate the sin. Um, and we hate the sin for the sake of the sinner because right. we want that sinner to, well, not be a sinner anymore and right. to have a better life. Right. And so, and, sorry about Jacob. Oh, I was going to say, it's also important with these, you know, like parameter number one is collectivism versus individualism, that... We read these not strictly as A versus B, but that it's a spectrum. No culture is strictly collective and or strictly individual. Be, well, because obviously if a culture is strictly individual, there would be no culture since culture is a product of communication. Um, 
but that it, it is a spectrum, and I think that's the case too with looking at, um, you know, as my example, contraception in our culture is ubiquitous. That doesn't mean that um, everybody in the culture is in love with contraception right. or uses it or thinks it's good. So just because there's a general tenor within a culture doesn't mean that everybody within it uh, upholds that part of their culture. There's certainly dissent. And so as we talk about the parameters, we should see it in view of a spectrum of on one extreme it is collectivism, the other is individualism, and every culture falls somewhere between them, but not typically on the extreme of either end. I, I, I think that's uh, a very good thing to point out, the idea of spectrum. 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 And that's, I mean, just, sorry, philosophical uh, tangent here. Um, one of my... Our whole show is a philosophical <laughs> tangent. <laughs> my whole life is a tangent. Um, I feel like I'm a spinoff of somebody else's TV show. I don't know. Um, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> Why would I say that? Anyway, so one of the things I look for in terms of a, um, uh, when I'm reading a philosopher, if I'm going to decide whether or not they're good, is if they take extreme positions on, mm. um, on opposites. Mm. Uh, do they deny oneness? Um, like like uh, not, like Parmenides, or do they deny the manyness like uh, like Zeno, where everything was just like w- one thing, there was no motion, um, or or Democritus, who all who saw that all things are just atoms in the void. There was in the void is essentially nothing. Um, How would you know? Did you stare into the void? Yeah, and it broke eye contact. It was really awkward. <laughs> um, quoting Nietzsche, this is great. <laughs> I think it's Nietzsche, right? Um, in any, in any case here, so we're moving on, uh, and so one of, my, one of the things I like about a good philosopher is somebody who tries, at the very least, to hold on to some sort of tension between the two, and um, I think that a, a better culture is going to be able to hold on to some of these, um, yeah. some of these extremes in the yeah. same way. And so, That's a good point. You're brilliant. Hey, thanks. You're welcome. Look at all this like nice talk we have to no, I'm not used to it. I know, I'm kind of uncomfortable. Me too. Uh, so... We have the two distinctions here. We have collectivism and individualism. Um, collectivism, the USCCB defines here as, um, in a predominantly collectivist culture, maintaining the group has priority over the individual's hopes and desires. The individual is defined by his or her position in the group, as older or younger, as male or female, as married or unmarried. The group or elders may make major life decisions, such as about professional uh, a professional occupation or a marriage partner uh, for individuals within the group. Family is understood as the extended family rather than simply the nuclear family of you know, father, mother, and kids. And maintaining the face of the group or its honor is paramount uh, of important to, import, uh, to, their, um, to their society. And loyalty to the group is among the highest values. Maintaining harmony within the group is a major concern. And I think that there is uh, a lot of good to be seen here. Um, and there's some things that I believe reflect a bit of our culture. Mm-hmm. I don't think we lean too f- far this way in terms of being a collectivist culture and under this definition. Um, but when it comes to things like... Uh, actually, I think we lean pretty far away from this one. Um, and it depends on who you ask, too, because you have some people who are uh, a bit more on the socialist aspect... Where our social side of things, where they where they think that the group or community should take care of the uh, individuals within it, all of the individuals within it, but at the highest possible level, which would be government, and that's that's a bit of a, a crazy extreme. Um, yeah, and I mean, within our own American culture, you're talking about you know a good philosopher will try and hold tension between the two. I think in our culture, we have a a very poor tension between collectivism and individualism. Yeah, we do. As as our political discourse has really fallen apart in the last two, nine, ten years, um, there's this, uh, very much us versus them uh, of the collectivists versus the individualists of the socialists versus the libertarians. Mm-hmm. And that's not a good tension to have. There, no. There's no more public discourse um, because everything is seen in the extremes and not on a spectrum. It's you're either one way or you're the other, right. and that's not a good thing either. Um, you know, I, I don't know where I would place uh, America in the collective versus individual spectrum at, at this point. I really Yeah, this, it's kind of tough, actually, now looking at this. Um, I, I think, though, uh, Molly and I have been watching a lot of Korean TV 
as you're well aware, I'm not sure if our listeners have heard about this one yet, but... You've, you've talked about Korean Have food. I? Yeah. Okay, I don't remember what I talk about from one day to the next, usually because I just want to forget all about it. It was probably <laughs> nonsense anyway. Yeah. But Molly and I have been watching a lot of Korean TV, and one thing that always strikes us is, um, so in, in this description of collectivism, it talks about how honor and saving face is of, among the most, uh, most paramount virtues, or par- uh, that's the most paramount uh, of uh, values. Um, and that's absolutely true in Korean culture, from what yeah. we're telling TV anyway, mind you, that if somebody has uh, some sort of, um, uh, if, they've, if they've offended somebody, the most dramatic thing that you can see in an episode is them running up to someone and getting down on their knees and begging and, start, and, and apologizing. And what, what happens with the camera angles is they'll take it from like eight different angles, like 17 different times. You will see ah. those knees hit the ground for like maybe 15, 20 minutes straight. <laughs> As they're apologizing, because this is a big deal, because they're they're debasing themselves, they're, right. they're showing that they're not worthy of being in, in this person's uh, yeah. environment. Um, in the same way, they're also more collectivist in terms of uh, they have this formal language where they will use um, words or, or case endings that indicate that the person they're speaking to is of a higher status than yeah. them, whether they be older or whether they yeah. be uh, somebody who is a uh, higher on the political or social. You know, sphere. I I think with America, part of the reason why it's difficult to peg us in one or the other is because if you go to Say California or New York, it's very collective. Uh, but if you go to say Wyoming or Texas, it's very individual. So I, I think the American culture as a whole, I don't know if you can really group into one or the other, or leaning even one way or the other. Um, unlike a place like Korea mm-hmm. or Japan, where they or Italy, where they've had a particular cult- culture developed over thousands of years for right. different ones. And with the same group of people, whereas America, we've had constant different influxes mm-hmm. of other groups and to attempt the social experiment of having a melting pot. Right. And so there's not, I don't think, a one cohesive culture that embodies the entirety of America. We're also massive. I mean, South yeah, Korea yeah. Is, like, is smaller than Minnesota. Right. But that being said, I'm going to go out on a limb here and try and put all of America into one group. Ooh. You ready? I am. I believe Americans in general are collectivists masquerading as individualists. And the reason I say that is because we have this sense of, uh, as Americans that we are better than the rest of the world a lot of times, or we are the police of the world or whatever else. John just lived to no, I'm just <laughs> um, That, uh, you know, and, and most certainly the great, some of the greatest technological, educational advances, medicinal advances in the world have come largely from America. but So we have a sense of, if you look on the world stage, we as a country are individual in opposition to the world or maybe individual reigning over the world, uh, but we don't want to... Uh, I think that that's kind of in the mindset of most Americans. And we don't, because of that, we don't want to admit we're really more on the collective spectrum. Because we're concerned about others. and Right. If you look yeah. at Hurricane Harvey and, and the cleanup after oh that. Oh, my gosh, Irma, yeah. I mean, you look at any natural disaster in our country, and, you know, we just uh, passed the, uh, what is it, 16th anniversary of 9-11. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think about all the men and women who selflessly ran into the, t- the towers that were falling to save people. I mean, it's just Americans have this amazing ability to love and serve their neighbor. But I think we're, we've become so jaded that we don't want to be vulnerable enough to say, yes, I want to love and serve my neighbor. And so we right. make ourselves appear as individuals. And I, th- I think that the, the natural human inclination is going to be towards collectivism. Right, because um, we're social by nature. Social by nature. And then when it comes to the individualism, um, we should define this because we've already talked about it a little bit. Um, in a predominantly individualistic culture, the individual has priority over the group. The individual is ultimately responsible for his or her life decisions. The group is, when all is said and done, the sum of the individuals who make up the group. Family is generally generally understood as the immediate or nuclear family. Note, I said nuclear, not nuclear. Mm-hmm. Just to throw back so to they're the not gonna explode. politician. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, loyalty to the larger group is contingent on the group's performance and support of the individual's life. Individuals are expected to be independent and creative, and they are encouraged to seek self-fulfillment. 
how the individual stands out from the group is an important measure of this. And I think that this is the mask that we do wear very well Mm -hmm. um, in the United States. You said you were saying that we're more individualistic. um, And this is what I see, at least on the surface of many of my teens, is that uh, uh, they don't really identify themselves in context of their family. They more or less identify themselves in context of their friends. In fact, there was somebody that I was talking to the other day who I'm very close with, and he told me that, um, what is it, He's, he, he quoted the, uh, that great quote, uh, the blood of, the, blood of uh, the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Mm-hmm. That's the full, full quote because he haven't heard it before. And his point was that those with whom he has developed those strong relationships with, yeah. to him, is more important than the familial bonds that he has. Mm. And he and I talked about that a little bit because families, families do deserve a particular, um, particular respect and in, in a higher um, na- natural place within a person's life, uh, especially the parents and grandparents, because they gave that person the gift of life, and there's right. a certain amount of respect that's due to them for right. that, because all thankfulness is uh, should be in proportion with the gift given yeah um granted there's always you know things that change and the like but we do tend to focus more on being with our uh peer group rather than our kin group which i think is very interesting Mm -hmm. uh seeking self-fulfillment yep absolutely the case you know (laughs) define your own values live your dream be who you can be be all who you can be these are just the slogans of people in our age group. Yeah. This is what we grew up yeah. with. So definitely a, a current of thought that's uh, certainly pushing an individualistic uh, movement in um, the United States. Hmm. What do you think, Jake? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. Jake, that's okay. We're here for you. Yeah. All of our Lost Voice listeners. That's right. We're here to support you. Um, oh, we need to actually move a little bit quicker through the parameters. We have 20 minutes left in the show. Sure, we can handle that. Uh, the next one is um, hierarchy versus equality. So hierarchy is power is une- unevenly distributed and inequality is presumed. The more power one has, so also the higher status authority is inherited. Sanctions and rewards are based on one's social position. Everyone in the society knows his or her place in the hierarchy. Communication between those who are lower on the power scale and those who are higher is often indirect in nature or carried out by mediators. Because so much communication is indirect, such situations are often termed high-context cultures. Whereas equality, uh, or culture of equality of power, says the power in the group is diffused and sometimes hard to locate. Locating power is often difficult because of the ideal of equality. But there are often unspoken rules that govern things. Authority is earned. Sanctions and rewards are based on one's performance. People can gain or lose status. Status is often seen as something earned rather than as something ascribed because of one's position. Communication is more direct in this situation because communication is more direct. These are often called low-context cultures. I'm not sure I completely agree with the descriptions that are given here. They're honestly a little bizarre. <laughs> they're, they're, um, yeah. A little difficult. Hierarchical power is, well, let's put it this way. Both of these, in terms of power, can be very, very bad. Mm-hmm. But there's merit in both of them, too. Right. A, a culture needs to have some sense of hierarchy. There needs to be some sense of um, protection, uh, some sense of... Uh, Unity. Higher power, unity, all of that. But there also needs to be a sense of, you know, nobody is denigrated for the mere fact that they're not the one in power. Mm-hmm. You know, I, there's definitely merit in this. Um, right, I mean, this is yeah. one of the things that people might not know is that St. Thomas Aquinas actually abdicated as the best form of government a um, constitutional monarchy mm. where there was a king who was in power who was uh, who had executive authority over the land um, but he was yet he was just one of many citizens within that country right. and that those who inhabit his kingdom also uh, had certain rights and um, uh, action and life within the polis, within the city, so that they had a a genuine uh, influence. And that the Constitution was supposed to help prevent the king from becoming a dictator, but also to help prevent the people from becoming a mob, uh, mob, 
and uh, and destroying things. And I think we're seeing a little bit. We've seen dictators and uh, and, and tyrants come up, you know, throughout history more often, yeah. you know, very often. Um, and we've also seen on the other end when people uh, fall too far on this equality side of things, where there's more of a, a rule by the many um, rather than the few. What happens is a small group hits a certain percentage, and then all of society topples. Mm-hmm. They start fighting against that. There's a mob rule. People are intimidated. It's a it's yeah. a despotism of the of the crowd rather yeah. than simply one ruler. And so there's a there's a danger to both. Um, and again, those two being held in tension, which is what Thomas was doing mm-hmm. in his pol- political philosophy, uh, is is going to be um, better than trying to lean one way or the other with these things. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I think the the point here is to understand that power is diffused in cultures differently than in other cultures. You know, you, Cuba, you know, power is um, had by the one dictator. Uh, America, ideally, power is distributed among the people. And this is going to affect how people see the church, mm-hmm. you know, because the church is hierarchical and for good reason. Not everybody should be a bishop. Not everybody should be a priest. You know, there needs to be a hierarchy for the sake of order and direction. Uh, but if you come from a, a culture where, you know, such as America, where the power is in the people, um, generally people are going to see the church more as the collective people of God idea, you know, mm-hmm. rather than um, seeing the church as hierarchical, such as. Uh, what the Europeans saw and, you know, the uh, canons of the church and and that kind of thing. Um, You know, church architecture in Europe is at times substantially different than here. Yeah. Because the focus is on the sanctuary and the altar and everything else. In America, a lot of times the focus is on the comfort of the people. (laughs) And again, it's uh, it's funny. Art is is an expression of the people's values. Yeah. That's that's, uh, interesting. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that gets me, too, is when people talk about how, you know, say things like, when is a church going to accept gay marriage or contraception or some sort of such, or, or women priests or some such absurdity? Um, it's like, yeah, maybe a, a large portion of Catholics in the, in the West believe that we ought to have those things as a part of acceptable practices within our Catholic doctrine. Yeah. But the kingdom of God isn't a democracy. Right. By name. It's a kingdom. And he has a prime minister named the Pope. And people who he uh, who, who God rules through are the bishops um, in, in union with the Pope. So these things are just not going to happen. Right. And it's, it's the Holy Spirit who makes those decisions. And, well, you know, uh, those decisions were made a long time ago, but when God made us uh, as we are. You mean within God's nature, which is eternal? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, eternal law. Yeah. Long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, so the, the third parameter is low tolerance of ambiguity versus high tolerance of ambiguity. Um, John, I didn't actually read a whole lot through this particular one, so I'm not sure. I'm going to be humble here and say not sure what they're driving at. I know you did a little study on this, so right. Well, the I, take the lead. Um, the idea here is that the, when the when the culture is looking at um, its own place within the community of I don't know, events in history, so to speak. Um, a low tolerance culture is going to be uh, looking for more actual meaning and context behind what's happening in the world. For instance, um, within my own worldview, I guess I would be a low tolerance uh, individual or more on the low toler- tolerance side of things mm-hmm. because I see the disasters, the the high points, the uh, the midpoints, you know, even the everyday. Um, everyday trivial things as a part of God's plan. Now, not all of them are as essential as others, um, but when something happens, God has a reason for it, and it will make sense within the whole scheme of history at some point. A high-tolerance person, um, or high-tolerance society, they don't expect that much. Uh, Life is just lived, Mm -hmm. some things just happen, um, and there's no real meaning behind it. So you might say low-tolerance society is reflect a little bit more of the choleric melancholic temperaments and the high tolerance societies reflect a little bit more of the phlegmatic temperament 
Just things happen. No things big happen. deal. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, perhaps. That's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's also a difference between them where the low-tolerance uh, societies want like a lot of hard and fast rules, a lot of black and white. Um, when it comes to our, uh, with, when it comes to certain rules um, or uh, or norms, uh, whereas a, a high tolerance uh, society is more or less lax. There's a lot more generous interpretation of the rules. So, Mr. Stewie, all. all right, Jacob. I'm curious. Where Nelson. would you place America between low and high tolerance? Hmm. 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 We need Jeopardy music. We do. Do, 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 do. I, I think America is say, very far towards one of them. I think the United States is very high tolerance. Really? Mm-hmm. I think it's the opposite. Well, <laughs> here's the reason why I say okay. that. Well, it depends on Convince what you're talking me. about. Convince me. It depends on what you're talking about. I think part of it, um, and, I, and I think I'm seeing where you come with low tolerance here, because... <laughs> <laughs> I know your twisted mind, Jake. I know how you think. But the reason why I say high tolerance um, is because we uh, seem to, within certain aspects of American culture, be okay with certain alternative lifestyles So, mm. as far as, they, uh, as they, um, people who will accept them uh, term it at, or uh, deem it as. Yep. Where it's just um, there isn't a real hard distinction between men and women, uh, right or wrong, uh, what what marriage and sex is for. Mm-hmm. We'll accept all that kind of stuff. Or when it comes to um, uh, religion and politics, well, sorry, religion and politics, as long as you are the same as I uh-huh. am, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's why I think it's actually low tolerance. Mm-hmm. I think the reality is you know, trying to obfuscate the difference between men and women and and gender roles and everything else um, is actually a symptom of a low-tolerant society. It's demanding that the rules change according to what I want it to be. A high-tolerant society would say, well, okay, fine, you go live your life, I'll live mine. But I think what's really happening is sometimes we appear as a high-tolerant society because Mm -hmm. people are too afraid to go against the demands of the change of rule. Did I convince you or did you convince me? I convinced myself halfway through thinking <laughs> about it. <laughs> Sweet. I didn't even have to say anything. You didn't. You just had to look at me with those baby blue eyes of yours. That's right. So, parameter four. Masculine versus feminine understanding of gender roles. This, ladies and gentlemen, <sighs> might be a powder keg. I don't know. It might be. With we'll, we'll see on the smooth, silky sounds of... WCAT Radio. (laughs) Masculine cultures. Gender roles are distinct and clearly allocated. Men are in charge in the public sphere, make decisions, and protect women. They are expected to be achievers and providers for their families. Women are kept in the private or home sphere, where they care for the children and the elderly. In these cultures, women are expected to be nurturing. Versus the feminine cultures. Gender roles are not clearly defined and tend to overlap. Women and men have an equal role in the public sphere, and they often share responsibility for the care of the household and the children. Decisions are made mutually. On the onset, Mr. Studi, I have to say that this is an unfair A versus B, masculine versus feminine assessment. All right, Jake, let's hear it. Because if it was really masculine versus feminine, the feminine description would say gender roles are distinct and clearly allocated. Women are in charge in the public sphere, make decisions and protect women. Ultimately, I think if it was really a truly feminine culture, it would just take the masculine culture description and replace men with women. Mm -hmm. But what we see, at least with this description, I think what the USCCB is trying to get at is the feminization of culture, not a feminine culture, which is different. Mm -hmm. Um, And most certainly... Uh, I think there's great value to have uh, women in public, uh, in the public sphere, and to have more of an equal role in the building of culture. But last week we talked about the difference between equality of proportion and equality of mathematics. And I think to have an authentic culture, you have to have that distinction of uh, mathematics and proportion. Women absolutely at all times should have equality to men in every possible way proportionally speaking 
Mathematically speaking, though, we need to understand the differences between men and women, respect them, and help men and women achieve what they're able to achieve according to the equality of proportion. So, that's what I have to say. I I actually don't know how you can make the assessment or the distinction between masculine and feminine culture if you actually believe that men and women have an equality of proportion. I think the, the distinction between masculine and feminine culture can only be born from an understanding of equality in the mathematical sense. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe the USCCB is going to send helicopters after me with special forces repelling down to get me. But I... I'm sorry on this one, John. I don't know if you agree with me or not. I think I think making the distinction between masculine and feminine culture can only come from thinking equality can be mathematical when equality in re- reality is only proportional. Well, right. Well, that's one of the the things here too. In in my political philosophy class, I'm taking right now at Holy Apostles. You have to save me from the repelling. Justify oh, that's fine. What I said. That's why Ned is funding our uh, um, obtainment of the. What, what we, the, the Swiss Guard uniforms. We're going to get the armor, too, so that way they Perfect. come in and like, oh, we can't attack the Swiss Guard. That'd be um, great. Wow. All right. Uh, anyway, so I'm taking a political philosophy course right now, and one of the things that absolutely blew me out of the water was, uh, and the book here that we're reading is uh, The Structure of Political Thought by Charles McCoy, was the uh, failure, a certain failure that, uh, Plato had within his political scheme in the in the Republic um, that was based on his metaphysics. Ooh, we have like four minutes oh. left. So not getting too deeply <laughs> into that, um, speaking of the metaphysics of, of gender, when we speak of man and woman, we're not speaking of two different kinds of things. Um, we're speaking of, yes, they both have human souls, they both have the human form, but because of the distinctive matter of uh, of man and woman, um, they the souls... Uh, the, the powers of the soul, reproduction and the like, and thinking, um, operate differently, but that soul is still female and that soul is still male because it is uh, informing a, a human, uh, a male body or a female body. Um, even after death, when the soul survives it, it still has that feminine distinction or that masculine distinction within it. And so there isn't a, a complete separateness here, but more of an analogical thing where there's uh, masculine characteristics of, of human uh, nature and feminine characteristics. And I don't think you could have a feminine culture or a masculine culture in the same way that you, in the way that you're talking about. You might have one that, uh, uh, that expresses masculinity or femininity at a um, you know, higher level than others. Yeah. But again, both, both have some goodness to them, both uh, that... Again, it has to be held in context and in intention. Yeah. So parameter five, real quick, lived experience uh, versus abstract approaches to time. Um, I put this in terms of people versus time cultures. And so you have certain cultures that are very people-oriented, and you have other cultures which are very time-oriented. In my experience working in the church, um, Anglo versus Latino cultures. Anglo cultures are very time-oriented. If there's an event at 7 p.m., you're expected to be there at 6.50. If the registration is due on September 1st, it should probably be in by July 1st. Um, With the Latino culture, it's very different. Uh, It's... You know, the paperwork isn't as important as being present. Um, And because I'm being attentive to my family, I might show up 20 minutes late, you know, and that's completely acceptable. And there's not uh, a right and wrong with this. It's, um, it's, there's good and there's good things and drawbacks to both. Um, Being too rigid with time alienates people. Being too uh, loose with time and not, not giving credence can frustrate programs um or, and not just programs but can um frustrate a well leaders well and, yeah you have to have well orders so i think i think you know in the anglo latino uh conversation among other conversations there can truly be a mutual enrichment and this is actually the parameter i'm most excited about and i think is most spot on i agree yeah yep well anyway so it did be at four minutes. We have a minute we? fifteen left. We uh, did great. Where are we going to find? What are we going to talk about? I don't in know. The next minute and fifteen seconds. I don't know. We're really not good at wasting time. Mm-hmm. We generally are really on pace with everything 
that we've been asked to do. Right, we fit that abstract, long-term, time-oriented culture. Right, we're not good with like people. To a T. But we're not good at that either, actually. We're not good with time? No, people. Yeah. Well, no, I just said we're not yeah. good with people. Right. Yeah, so we're, you and I are a time-oriented culture. We've created our own culture. Really. We have. Between Jake and Studi, there's a culture. There's a Lost Voice culture. It is, it is, it's a culture. I think as we grow the Lost Voice program, we should do like a Lost Voice convention Ooh. in Minneapolis and invite all our listeners and just get to meet people and like have good talks and maybe some adoration and like be great. We'd love to, love to do that. In fact, how about this? If you are listening, period, whether or not you have a question for us, just let us know where you're from. What you're listening to and what's your favorite yeah. aspect of it. We want to get is. to know our audience. Yeah, I'm tired of not knowing who I'm talking yeah. to. I'm just talking right to you. Right on in. Normally. Lost voice at WCATradio.com. We'd love to hear from you guys. That's lost voice at WCATradio.com. Oh, look at that. We're out of time. Oh, right. what happened? Lost voice, etc. Socrates, wisdom, and the like. Join us next time when we talk about Module 3 of the Intercultural Competencies Workshop with the USCCB. This is John Studi along with Jacob Nelson. Signing off. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.